Ladies and gentlemen, have a good evening. I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon evening. And I think it's a very timely occasion. You know, yesterday was the uh, worldwide watched inauguration by President uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump left, uh, at least for the moment, the White House in Washington. A couple of days earlier, we had seen events of January 6, 2021, which I think came as a shock for the rest of the world and most likely also for the Americans. And therefore, I'm very happy uh, to have uh, tonight the chance to talk to a very prominent and, and, and very highly estimated colleague from the University of Miami, David Abraham. He is a professor emeritus of that university. He is not only a lawyer, he also taught uh, German and European history at, for instance, Princeton University. He is very, very in, well informed about, you know, European affairs. He's been traveling very often to Germany, visiting, you know, all kinds of scientific institutions here in Berlin and at other places. And of course, he is also a very prolific writer. He has been extensively publishing on the sociological dimensions of law. He does research with, you know, uh, social uh, legal questions. He's very well informed about what's going on in Germany, what's going on in Europe. And uh, in particular, he wrote a very exciting uh, recent book entitled Wer gehört zu uns? Who belongs to us? Immigration, Integration and Solidarity in the Welfare State 2019. And so very welcome, David. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have you here tonight to get an inside perspectives on the last days, what happened in the United States and what I think is also very important if you look at the development of global democracy and democracy in particular also in Europe. In 2016, when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, you wrote an article in the German Verfassungsblock and I brought a quote to start our conversation with. You wrote uh, uh, four years ago that Trump was not elected by an angry or distorted majority and not as much uh, of the liberal media would like to have it by a racist minority of Yahoo blue collar losers. He was elected in the same country and to uh, a very considerable extent by the same electorate that voted twice for an African-American president in larger number. I think that is a very well observed phenomenon and we see the American society still split today. Yesterday we heard that uh, President Biden in his inauguration speech emphasized that democracy has won, that democracy will uh, prevail. He kind of very emphatically endorsed unity and the uh, reconciliation and healing of the American people. However, there are these two sets of pictures, you know, yesterday's historical day and January 6th being another historical day. And we are, I think, all wondering what kind of impressions left you know, January 6th on the one side and yesterday on the other side in America, what impact does it have on American society and on American democracy? Well, first of all, Marcus, thank you very much for that kind and generous uh, introduction. It's my pleasure uh, to be joining uh, you all today. Uh, obviously, uh, today brings a, a sense of uh, relief, both uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, the inauguration went smoothly. There did not seem to be any uh, major uh, violent events in any of the state capitals. Uh, Donald Trump left Washington rather quietly. Uh, he didn't even pardon himself or his family, <laughs> as many people thought he would do going out the door. Uh, so um, it, it ended more with a thud than a, uh, an explosion. That said, I, I do think that this is uh, most likely a momentary lull because the larger crises that Trumpism uh, both um, represented and accelerated uh, continues. Uh, the, um, the crisis that we're seeing, the larger crisis, if I put a larger, uh, um, a larger framework around it for the moment, uh, has something to do with the decline of American dominance and American leadership 
which was certainly cemented after World War II, began perhaps even earlier. Uh, and we're seeing a crisis in that uh, to, um, uh, to cite the um, Italian communist theorist uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, the old is dying. The stable system of American world uh, leadership and dominance, uh, the new has not yet been born. And in the meantime, we see uh, numerous morbid, uh, numerous morbid symptoms. Um, uh, let me name a couple. You know, we've had endless wars, which is on the periphery, which is something Trump uh, was able to use very effectively. Uh, we've had what seems to be an immiseration of a good part of the uh, middle, cl middle class, uh, a grotesque rise in inequality, uh, the professionalization of mercenary military forces, uh, very visible elite corruption and incompetence, uh, a decline in popular deference to elites, uh, environmental resource degradation, uh, a flow of non-citizen colonial subjects from the periphery to, uh, to the metropole, uh, all of these things which are kind of very macro and uh, uh, broad uh, form the backdrop to uh, the, the core of the crisis. And I think the core of the crisis, uh, certainly since, um, since the stalling of Reaganism, since the stalling of the Republican and then adopted by the Democrats neoliberal project, uh, what we've seen is a, a rupture between representatives and represented, both among the Democrats and the Republicans. Among the Democrats, we have uh, already a good feel for it. The industrial working class, the Rust Belt, uh, and this is uh, a bit true in Germany and Britain and France as well, uh, which in the high tide of well-paid, highly unionized industrial capitalism, was the backbone of the Democratic Party uh, is gone. Uh, most of those jobs are gone. Um, the educational system is not effectively trained uh, people. Uh, that has left um, former Democratic voters available for this kind of populist Trumpian politics. Uh, on the other hand, on the Republican Party side, uh, we have seen uh, the, the exhaustion of the um, anti-taxation, anti-spending view. Uh, too many people are hurting. They don't really have the austerity deficit mentality, which was attributed to them by the Republican Party. People like McCain lost, people like Romney lost. And uh, what both parties did in an attempt to salvage their prior constituencies was to turn from class to culture. In the case of the Democrats, we see the rise of identity politics, diversity, things that don't cost much money, but build on a liberal tradition of enlightenment. Uh, on the Republican side, we see the ethno-nationalism, uh, the populist uh, anti-elite sentiment uh, as a new basis. Plus, and this is something that I think researchers will be working on in the next several years. When one looks at the Republicans in the Congress who, uh, who's, who challenged Biden, the legitimacy of Biden's electoral victory, they did not, for the most part, come from these um, Rust Belt uh, areas. They came from a kind of new Mittelstein suburbia. They came not from uh, the highly rich, who liked the old Republican Party quite happily. Um, and they did not so much come from, um, uh, from Rust Belt workers. They came from these kind of small metropoles that have developed in the United States, not the, not the really big cities, but the smaller cities, uh, which are kind of ex-urbia, just beyond suburbia, uh, with uh, a rising in some cases arising, but at the same time precarious new middle stand. And that's going to need more investigation. What is clear, uh, and I've probably said enough about this topic, is that 
the break between representatives and represented is what opened the door to a kind of sui generis Trumpian politics. And it's not gone. Absolutely. I think that is a, a key word you say that it's not gone. And I like your description, you know, the turn from class to culture, because I think that describes it in a, in, in a very, I think, insightful way what happened, you know, what the new narratives are. And uh, I think your analysis is also striking that, you know, the people being in favor of Trump's movement, movement are not only the Rust Belt, maybe not even primarily the Rust Belt people, but that new kind of, you know, middle class, but still being in a very uh, precarious situation. And that kind of leads me to the question which you just already hinted to, you know, Trump might have been gone, but Trumpism, you know, also given the phenomena you analyzed will remain. So what will happen to, to, to Trumpism? Of course, you know, you, you, you can't, you know, read the glass bowl, but you know, what will happen to, to Trumpism and will we see some, somebody like Trump, you know, being the next candidate for the Republican party uh, for years in the future and for years? Well, th this is a very serious question. You know, was this the beer hall was last two weeks ago did we see the beer hall putsch of 1923 uh to be followed a decade later by the uh rise into power of uh of the kind of movement that was represented two weeks ago on the capitol steps uh or um is has this a burnt out phenomenon of a uh, mob which doesn't have the zit splice to to continue its its activity. Mm -hmm. Although I would say social media lowers the cost of continuing those activities uh, uh, so that they probably will. Well, the question is um, to the extent that Trump is a performer uh, who managed to uh, run a successful uh, reality show operation, he might be hard to replace. On the other hand, we see figures like Josh Hawley Tom Cotton, uh, others who are not um, self-made millionaires. They don't have that, uh, uh, they don't have that anti-elite sentiment. In fact, they're graduates of Stanford, Princeton, Harvard, Yale. Uh, they've clerked on the Supreme Court in the case of both Cruz and Hawley. Um, they, they act populist. Hawley, for example, uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders' $2,000 stimulus check for every American. Um, and even in the end of his own days, Trump came forward to advance that $2,000 proposition. The rest of the Republican Party didn't want to see it. So if we can have that kind of populist ideology, can we have it with a leader who doesn't have the outsiderness that mm -hmm. Trump brought? And that question remains open. Um, I don't think the family um, uh, road stuff is there for Ivanka or Jared. Um, they have moved to Florida, uh, possibly to begin a political career here. But my own sense is that's not successful, uh, not going to be successful. If, if there is um, a strong challenge, one of the things I should say that Trump did manage to do is that Republican parties in many states and local areas are in the hands of very strong Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. This could lead to a long-term battle within the Republican Party that will lead either to their defeat and the restoration of a kind of Bush compassionate conservatism, which tries to win over some minorities. Uh, Bush himself received 40% of the Hispanic vote uh, as a presidential candidate. So, and cultural conservatism is, uh, can be matched with social welfareism. I mean, Poland is a dramatic example of that. Absolutely. So the Bush sites could recapture the Republican party, in which case uh, the Trump movement could become a third party, which is a death, a death wish in the United States. Uh, or it could become a boisterous uh, agitation group within the Republican Party. Um, you know, we have a two-party system, so um, you know we can't have the Linka and the AfD. Both of those groups are incorporated respectively inside one of the two major parties. Um, 
And that leaves the situation very open as to the future of Trumpism. It is certainly not gone. It's certainly not gone. No, absolutely. I'd, 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 I'd share that in, in that result. And I think that is a very uh, insightful analysis of, of what happened. And that brings me to a follow up question. You know, I think you already hinted to some of the factors. What Trumpism makes so attractive? You, you said Trumpism could be an ideology, but many maybe use it also as a simple political strategy to gain voters. And, and if you could, could maybe, you know, from your perspective, again, name the points that make it so attractive for people, in particular for the electorate you just described, not only the Rust Belt people, but also, you know, that middle class people who are definitely not radical, who are definitely not per se racist or something like that, but who are just, you know, people that could be, you know, from a European perspective, also be seen in the middle you know, of the political spectrum, but they turn to adhere and to stick to, you know, the Trumpian promises. And what makes them so attractive in particular for these people? Right, so I, I would say um, uh, two or three things about that. First of all, every country, although there is a general crisis of representation in the Western democracies, one certainly sees it with the mm -hmm. demise of the virtual demise of the SPD, um, there are also, uh, individual situations through which the general crisis is refracted. So the question of race in the United States, uh, ra racial justice, uh, the, the failure to destroy the Confederacy after the Civil War is with us still as a curse 150 years later. Uh, those are some very uh, specific issues. Uh, that said, uh, and the races, the element of racism certainly was an aspect that Trump could tap and did tap very successfully. But I think it's politically very mistaken as well as strategically unwise to say that 48% of the population is somehow so committed to racism and homophobia and whatever else uh, that it votes for Trump. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, first of all, political allegiance is very, what the political scientists call sticky. People vote for Democratic Party and the Republican Party for generations. Uh, so there are people who would have voted, who did vote for McCain and Romney and, and Trump and whoever the next Republican nominee will be, they will vote for as well. So we're, we're talking sort of at the margins, right? Uh, the difference between um, uh, uh, the, the um, between success and failure, as we saw, depending on the state can be 200,000 votes. Uh, but even taken nationally, uh, 45 to 50 percent of the population has to be addressed. And th the issues here, the cultural issues, uh, are very real. Uh, the undemocratic way in which abortion became national policy in the United States has never been addressed. I mean, the Germans addressed this through this legal artifice of criminal but not punishable. Absolutely. Illegal but not punishable. We don't have a, a, a mechanism like that. Uh, so abortion has remained a rallying cry amongst cultural conservatives. Uh, uh, the uh, success of uh, middle class feminist issues uh, has been very alienating to women who are not in the professional class. Uh, Trump's success amongst women, despite all of his sexual and other uh, improprieties and moral failings uh, testifies to uh, uh, the, the willingness to overlook an individual's fault uh, on behalf of what they are willing to do. The Christian evangelical movement, which I do not claim to be able to understand, is mere feel zu fremd. I, I really mm -hmm. can't get inside of it, but the uh, but I have seen some and listened to some of the talks and gatherings, the animus toward uh, abortion, the animus toward same-sex marriage, the, the uh, willingness to indulge even as morally deficient a figure as Trump because he's willing to take a stand. Perhaps mm -hmm. the most popular thing he did was the appointment of all these conservative judges. Absolutely. Uh, 
which was an area, I might add, where the old Republicans and the new Trumpists were on the same page. Right? That served both their interests. Uh, the tax cuts of the early years were Trump's um, homage to mm -hmm. the uh, classical Republican agenda. And at that point, it seemed that Trump had uh, put together the kind of alliance that Hannah Arendt called the, the marriage of capital and the mob. But the problem is that you cannot call 48% of the population the mob. And we saw the mob attacking the Capitol building, but all those people who voted, um, voted also for low unemployment. And these are, you know, when Trump went around saying that black unemployment is lower than it ever has been, that was not one of his many lies. That was in fact, statistically correct. Now, whether one might just say that he inherited the benefit of the extended, slow, but extended Obama recovery, that's a detail. You know, people, I think political scientists have shown that um, uh, the events, when it comes to the, ec the economic side of, of voter choice, uh, the framework is six months to 18 months. It's not every, it's not from 2008 to 2020, it's, it's short. And then the shorter term, Trump was both lucky and um, and he got a few things going. The 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 uh, decline in manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. which has been going on for over a generation, slowed some during his term of office. Not nearly commensurate with his rhetoric, of course, uh, but it did slow some. Um, the the turn against uh, job exports. Uh, to Mexico, to China, was more rhetorical than real, but it was prominent. I mm -hmm. think that appealed to people. Absolutely. So I one has to give credit. Sure. Sorry, so, sorry to interrupt here because I, I think you, you gave quite a, many, many reasons why you know Trumpism is so attractive. And I'd like to combine that with a question that just came from the audience. One of our PhD students who happens to be an American raised a very interesting question and said, well, you know, does Trumpism to survive, you know, to, to send that message of, you know, attractiveness, does it need the stage of the White House and the echo chamber of the White House? Is there any chance that, you know, without a grand stage, without, you know, twittering as president of the United States of America, that Trumpism might lose a bit of its attractiveness because, you know, the movement can't speak to the people in the way it could before? Well, th that's a very good question. I, I know you want to discuss later the role of social media. It's Absolutely. certainly true that for all the hostility between Trump and the media, they fed off each other. I mean, the circulation numbers for all of the liberal uh, journals and not to mention the mainstream newspapers uh, went up. So uh, the, the platform, um, both uh, historical and social media platforms uh, benefited from uh, Trump who in turn benefited from the prominence they gave him. Um, Novelty is very uh, important uh, in um, American politics in a way uh, different, I would say, from Germany. I think the, the calm, the stability, the continuity, uh, or at least from the Bundesrepublik, the stability, the confidence that someone like Merkel has projected for almost a generation, uh, for Kaufsichnik here. I mean, it doesn't, in the US, uh, we want, something we want you know a kennedy buzz or an obama hope and aspiration and dynamic and one of biden's weaknesses is clearly portrayed that he's a dull old man right that was his vulnerability and um and so whether uh whether trump can repeat the show without having the platform you know, you can only come down the steps of Trump power uh, in that dramatic way uh, once. So it is true, but, um, you know, you start with a beer hall putsch and the next uh, uh, is an electoral turn. And then um, 
one of the troubling things that Trump did manage to do was a little bit of uh, Gleichschaltung, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. If you combine the resignations and the firings and the second tier appointments that did not require congressional approval, we saw, for example, um, you know, the delay in sending the National Guard to the Capitol because Trump appointees wanted to let it play out for a while. Uh, that and and then you also see in Germany uh, the tendency of the of the police to lead to the right. I mean, when you know, in the case of Weimar, we've had many books written about it, but it it's true in the contemporary scene. I mean, law and order means uh, by definition almost. Uh, leading to the right, and Germany has seen the penetration of ultra right wing people into the police and security apparatus. And and one of the s disturbing things here was to see uh, the prevalent, not prevalence, but the presence of uh, former military people in the mob a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the the forms may change. There may be a bit more um, Trump inside the system uh, in the years to come. We'll have to see about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find that uh, quite striking. And you say in the years to come, there is another question from the audience, which I think is also a question that I had. Would you say that Trump changed America for a whole generation that, you know, the generation who experienced now Trump will see politics and democracy in a different way and that, you know, healing and reconciliation, you know, from that perspective might be very difficult because he had so such a strong impact on a whole generation. Or on the other side, one could argue, well, it's been only four years and of course we had the campaign before. So the impact might not be strong enough to really kind of shape and, 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 and give the political infrastructure for a whole generation of young voters? Well, institutionally, we shall see. Uh, ideologically, Trump introduced a kind of Schmittian politics of yeah. friends and enemies yeah. into American public life, which uh, partly because of the narrow band of American politics uh, had been absent. Uh, and Biden yesterday spent most of his speech talking about unity and compromise and Politics is not about burning down the enemy's house. Uh, very kind of anti Smithian um, politics. Uh, Biden is a product of coup handle uh, and uh, would like to restore uh, that kind of politics. Though he, he also, I think, learned from the success of the Sanders campaigns and from the depths of the current crisis that a little bit more is required. And if he does push the New Deal type policies, uh, he probably will see that the Republicans uh, are able to um, to return to Schmidtian friend enemy uh, politics and block him uh, from anything too ambitious. Um, whether we now have in the long durée uh, a, a friend enemy politics, mm -hmm. um, I. I, I I don't know. We'll have to reconvene in a few years on that one. I am. I take that as a promise, you know. Okay, I, 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 I love to do so that. Already, please save the date, you know. We okay, I, I am sitting here in Florida, right, which was uh, a part of the Confederacy, yeah. and which has become a kind of Zamobekan for um, uh, conservative and right-wing migration from Latin America, Brazil, Colombia, wherever there was a left-wing uh, revolution in Latin America, the um, Anshan regime came to Florida. So there is there is a raw material here for a hard right, for a hard right uh, politics. Uh, on the other hand, as we saw in Georgia in the senatorial election, uh, internal migration uh, is a significant factor. Absolutely. Um you also mentioned in you know describing the situation what 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 happened uh, on January 6 as a putsch or something like that and that would be the next question which i have i'd be very interested in knowing you know how the in events of uh, January 6 before we continue that kind of you know broader picture talk were 
seen in the United States. If you, if you read German newspapers, other European newspapers, many said it was an attempt of a coup d'etat. Was it also seen in the US as an attempt of a coup d'etat or just, you know, a militant mob doing something? Did the Americans feel that there is something, you know, endangering American democracy in its very substance? Was that really an attempt of a coup d'etat or was it something different, maybe something not being that dangerous? Well, I mean, it, it, something can be dangerous without being a well thought out coup d'etat as we think of. <laughs> You know, a kind of, good answer. Yeah, a, a Pinochet event, or you know, uh, or kind of classic staged uh, coup d'état. Um, one of the people who was honored yesterday was a Capitol Hill policeman who uh, Eugene Goodman, who uh, then uh, became the begleiter for uh, Vice President last night. Um, you know, deflected part of the mob, maybe you know, 30, 40, 80 people. Uh, away from the door of the Senate and let them chase him into a kind of zakas, uh, one floor higher in the building. You know, the door of the Senate was unlocked and there were people with guns and, and ties and it would not have taken much to, um, it would not have taken much to uh, go into the Senate and shoot one or two people, kill them, um, tie up the uh, vice president who suddenly became a target of their wrath. So it was a very, very dangerous moment. Uh, they had uh, no plans beyond having the Congress declare Donald J. Trump the, the proper president of the United States. But I don't think they had uh, plans that went very far uh, beyond that. But that doesn't lessen the extent to which it was dangerous. Um, you know, um, Biden is getting a, a lot of good press uh, in places like the New York Times uh, for calling for unity and, and peace, but uh, it's a reminder that um, uh, only a few weeks after Abraham Lincoln did the same uh, in 1865, he was uh, assassinated by his enemies who, who um, were defeated but not repentant. So it doesn't take too many people to um, to cause a real disaster. Um, I mean, it's an inside push, you know, the, when you have Ludendorff and, and, um, yeah. and, and Hitler in, in the Munich uh, beer hall, it's an outsider push, except that there, of course, were a few insiders in the beer hall. But um, uh, this was to keep someone in office who was in office, which is a kind of peculiar form of of putsch. Um, so I, I, it was a mob action unleashed by the uh, standing president uh, to see how far he could go in having himself re, re Um I, I don't know if there should be a new technical term for that. Um, well, I'm not sure whether you need a new technical term for that because you you delivered a very well well description of what happened and I think that brings me to a follow up question which was also raised by the audience Mrs von Gierke and others um, after the coup d'état if we name it that way or that something like a coup d'état many you know Republican politicians who formerly had been very close to Trump stepped aside a bit and kind of disassociated. And that is a question I think, which is very interesting, you know, for people in Germany, will there be now a tendency and also in, in the rest of Europe, will there now be a tendency in the Republican party to say, okay, you can't win elections anymore with, you know, the Trump way. So we got to distance ourselves from Trump, even though we might want to pursue Trumpian politics in the future, or do you still believe that there quite a lot of Republicans that rather want to, to display uh, allegiance with Trump and say he's been deprived of his presidency, the elections have been stolen and we still support him. I think, you know, th that pictures of January 6th could have been a decisive moments saying, oh, well, now he went too far. How would you, how would you see that? Is that a, a trigger for Republicans to say, oh, well, wait a moment, that's maybe a bit too much? Well, this is the split in the Republican Party that we alluded to earlier. So on the one hand, you have the um, uh, Senate majority uh, leader and about to become the minority leader, 
uh, saying that, yes, Trump incited a mob and a riot and not giving a definitive no as an answer to the question of uh, uh, conviction in the Senate of impeachment on impeachment. On the other hand, in the House, the top three leaders, um, only the number three, uh, ironically, Dick Cheney's daughter, Liz Cheney, uh, only she came out uh, uh, clearly and unequivocally against Trump. The number one and the, uh, leader tried to sit on both sides of the fence. Uh, the number two leader stood with Trump. And there was massive uh, attacks in the House, not in the Senate, but amongst House Republicans on the defectors, uh, on those who had turned against Trump. So um, this could turn into a regional fragmentation of the Republican Party. Uh, Trump people will remain strong in certain congressional districts. Uh, this is also a byproduct of gerrymandering. You know, many of these oh, of people course. are in districts where they are much more likely to lose a Republican primary than they are to lose to a Democrat in November. And so they always worry about their right, not their left flank. And that, um, that bodes, uh, I don't want to say ill, but it portends a conflict in the Republican Party between those who uh, have benefited from the Trumpism, uh, Trumpicization, and those who want to return to um, a more popular conservatism. Yeah, and could you name maybe some some people who could take leadership in the future in the Republican Party? You already said that you are a bit doubtful whether you know Ivanka or Jared Kushner will be you know the big shots in the future. But of course, now it's also the moment in time where some people in the Republican Party might you know prepare you know their career and maybe step by step you know uh, prepare for the next elections to become maybe the 47th president. You know, some newspapers in Europe even said that. That Pence might have something like that in mind. Do you do you think this is this is likely? Uh, uh, Pence uh, has clearly lost the um, uh, approval of the closest Trump followers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Trump did rescue him from the trash bin. Uh, he had lo he, his future was very much in doubt uh, back in Indiana, uh, and he took Pence because of his connection to the. Christian conservative uh, movement. But I think Pence is not the one to watch. Um, it's interesting, two of the hardest right young Republican senators, uh, Tom Cotton from Arkansas and Josh Hawley, Hawley from Missouri, one of them stuck with Trump to the last moment, the other Cotton backed away, or yeah. at least he went into radio, so-called radio silence uh, in the last days. They are the two people to watch. They are both from uh, the more southern part of the Midwest. Uh, they are elite educated, but uh, won elections as outsider populists. Uh, they would be the ones to watch to pick the Trump mantle. The question is whether they may be too insiderish to have this system, anti-system, uh, attacking the system. I mean, you know, for Uh, for those of us who are German historians, you know, the Weimar years are about attacking the system. And Trump was the one who could attack the system. Uh, whether a Hawley could attack the system in the same way um, or a Cotton, uh, I don't know. But if I were a betting man, those are the two names I, I would bet on. Um, on the other hand, you know, we also have a tradition of People coming out of nowhere. I mean, no one, mm -hmm. almost no one could have identified Barack Obama four years before he became. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Important point. In, in that situation that we face now, we have been very happy that, you know, everything went peaceful yesterday and no further riots. But do you expect there will be further violence in the upcoming weeks that people, you know, might get angry again that that maybe you know the hardcore trump fan said it's too dangerous to do it immediately around the 20th of january but maybe we are going to expect something next month that there will be still anger and riots and violence to be seen on american streets uh, my uh, crystal ball is not 
better than anyone else's. I do think that the very heavy show of force, not only in Washington, but in 50 state capitals yesterday, uh, had to be a deterrent. Uh, we did see, even when Trump was uh, riding high in his most successful uh, period in the middle of his presidency, we did see his uh, most radical supporters, uh, you know, sending poison to Democratic politicians yeah. and arming themselves with these horrible weapons, which are readily available in the United States, uh, in most places in the United States. So it would not take too many uh, people like that. Um, I'm quite certain that um, uh, Democratic governors and Congress people will have um, much more than normal security protection in the weeks to come. Uh, I don't foresee an organized action. Uh, perhaps it's, it's premature, but the New York Times carried a story today already about the disappointment in some of these hardcore right-wing groups, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, that Trump let them down in the last minute. Um, so, you know, maybe they will uh, go back to their beer halls and, and uh, social media posts and QAnon conspiracy um, thinking. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. The problem is it really in this country does not take many people to create uh, chaos. Look at all this non-political mass killings that we have had. Uh, politically motivated one would be no more difficult to undertake. Absolutely. I, I think you already mentioned the social media, but before we turn to that point, which I think is very important for us, I have another interesting question from the audience. And I think that's a question that many people in Germany and Europe are often thinking about. It's the question of the pardon the president granted, you know, in the last uh, night in office to so many people. So, of course, there is a big tradition and, and, and maybe you can briefly explain the constitutional basis and also explain, was that something very uncommon, you know, other presidents also did something like that. Was, was it really outrageous what Trump did, you know, pardoning around about 140 or, uh, of his buddies, or uh, was that something one could say, okay, that's, you know, typical political tradition within America? Well, the pardon power, uh, as written in the Constitution, is very broad and, and very unrestrained. There is an office in the Justice Department to which pardon applicants are supposed to submit their petitions. Uh, and mostly they are rejected. Um, unfortunately, Bill Clinton was probably the one who took the first significant step away from that and pardoned uh, the husband of a major donor, uh, the rich, rich R-I-C-H, the rich family, um, and gave, uh, cast a light on well, what are these pardons about? Uh, and so for a while, uh, the next presidents, Bush and, and uh, Obama backed away and tended to find cases of people unjustly uh, sentenced to extremely mm -hmm. long terms, either for nonviolent drug offenses or racially suspect cases um, and the like. Um, uh, Trump, I think he enjoyed uh, creating the speculation that he would pardon his family or himself, or I thought for a while, frankly, I will confess I, I was wrong, that he would step down one day early in order to have Pence pardon him uh, and his entire family. And in the end, um, uh, it was the real Trump. Most of the people he pardoned were crooks and not politically significant <laughs> people. Um, you know, this was classic Trump, uh, but, um, you know, it had that same cleverness. So he, three rap, uh, African-American rap singers who had been sentenced on weapons charges, he pardoned, uh, he pardoned, uh, on the other hand, also a major fundraiser for the Republican Party uh, who had um, both um, financial irregularities and sexual irregularities. Um, the only one that was really in the spirit of Trumpism was Steve Bannon. Bannon, yeah. And um, 
you know, to the extent that he had ever a philosopher, Bannon was his philosopher. Um, but he didn't pardon his family members and he didn't uh, pardon himself. And the, um, pardon in, the pardons of three or four weeks ago, Flynn and company were really much worse in terms of uh, undermining uh, democratic process and legitimacy. Absolutely. This was much more trutzy than it was political, I would say. I, I love that description and the term more trotzy than political. I, I, I find that also when I read in the newspaper whom he granted the pardon, it was like, okay, I play again one of those games and surprise people and, and be right. a stubborn guy and do it in a very different way than everybody would have expected that I would do it. And um, let me come, come, come back to my social media point, which we already addressed, you know, quite some times uh, in that uh, talk. I think Trump really left an impact on, you know, political dialogue on political culture in the way he used social media and in the way his followers used social media, you know, the Twitter account, the Twitter account of the president canceled, you know, some kind of, you know, rather outrageous events. Mm -hmm. And it would bring me to the question of, you know, which role did social media play for Trump to become so prominent to, to get the movement, you know, he's using uh, on purpose that term movement to get movement started and there was that question whether you need maybe the White House as an echo chamber and the stage but you know of course you have social media as wonderful echo chambers that maybe you can do without that prominent place you know located Pennsylvania Avenue 1400. Well there are a number of things that could be said about that I guess I would begin by saying that Trump was the first Foucauldian president yeah, very our, good. Yeah. <laughs> our, our deconstructionist post uh, rationalist uh, colleagues who um, um, uh, make the arguments that uh, facts and truth are only a projection of power uh, and there is no there there uh, open the door quite wide for uh, every man his own truth. I mean, we used to say people are entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. Well, uh, you can't say that anymore. I mean, people, um, you know, it's not just about Lugan Presso or fake news. It's about creating truths through uh, consensus and social media platforms provide the opportunity for 2 million people to say, not only as they might have 30 years ago, there were unidentified flying objects from Mars. I saw them, didn't you see them too? You know, that kind of marginal group uh, truth. Uh, brought now into the center of the uh, political universe. Uh, you know, so Trump, uh, on his first day, when he said that his inauguration crowd was the biggest ever and bigger than Obama's, and I was expecting his press secretary to say something like, well, you know, if you count the number of people who watched on television and who saw it around the world, you know, some kind of Mm -hmm. trimming the facts a little bit. But instead, it turned out that an out and out lie is quite viable if enough people endorse it. And that was uh, the um, that was what the social media platform enabled it was the the systematic proliferation and seconding of alternative truths, alternative realities. And um, now I whether um, uh, the left learned from the right uh, as a little aside, one of the last things that Trump did was empower a group of conservatives to write a critique of the teaching of American history in universities and colleges. And one of the interesting things they learned uh, in wanting to attack identity politics, they said that the origin of identity politics was in John C. Calhoun, who was the major speaker for the justification of slavery and the superiority of the white race. So they have learned, I mean, they learn from the left. They learn even from identity politics, uh, creating alternative truths, universes, discourses. Um, uh, it's, um, 
mag it's a magnifying power that social media has provided. And I don't see how it's stoppable. Um, what would have happened if Twitter had turned off the Trump account two years ago? Of course, yeah. I don't know. I, they wouldn't have had the courage. I think it's only after the self implosion that, um, you know, the rats started to jump the ship and uh, uh, the social media uh, was able to unplug him uh, without fear of massive uh, backlash. Absolutely. Um if, if, if you look in particular at that influence of the, the, the social media and the situation in the US, we have already been talking about, you know, the coup d'etat and stuff like that. And in German newspapers and European newspapers, there's always also that kind of, you know, reference to a civil war and to the civil war in the 19th century and that, you know, we might experience something close to a civil war, which is maybe now a virtual civil war that we see in the media, in the social media, but it could turn into uh, blunt violence on the streets. Um, what is your impression? Is is the United are the United States is American society at the moment something facing being close to a civil war, or would you describe it in, in, in very different terms and say no, the civil war is, is something really different? I think it's very fractured. Uh, I think there are hostile and opposing camps. This comes back to the effect of uh, Schmidt introduction of Schmidtian uh, thinking into American. Uh, politics. One of the things that's very striking is um, uh, how geographical uh, this is. Uh, we talk about red states and blue states, but um, there are very few places that are closely balanced. Uh, so uh, if you look at the map, it's a real geographic fracturing. There are some places, as we just saw in Georgia, that are on tipping points. Um, but for the most part, uh, there's very little movement. What there is is an intensification of the majorities within each place, within mostly based on states. But there's an intensification of the dominance of, of the one party uh, or the other. So there is, in that sense, civil, civil division, very broad civil division, uh, fighting in the streets, I think very sporadic. I mean, Trump invented, uh, as he called it, <laughs> Antifa. So uh, uh, Antifa. So there are uh, very few places in the United States, uh, in the Northwest, uh, Oregon, Wisconsin, uh, Idaho, where there is a kind of tradition of of anarchist uh, tradition on the left uh, and on the right. Uh, and we saw during the Black Lives Matter protests in places like Seattle and Portland, uh, um, counter violence uh, from the right. Uh, we saw in Milwaukee, Wisconsin is also a kind of tipping place. Um, we saw, you know, right wing activists uh, kill uh, two protesters um, in the uh, Black Lives Matter protests uh, in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, so there are places where head-to-head -head confrontation is quite possible. Uh, but I think what is more striking and will be more enduring is uh, a real geographic uh, division of, of the country, um, which might be, you know, a little bit like uh, the eastern the eastern lender yeah. in, in Germany. No, a kind of long-term division of the country where different uh, cultures dominate in different places. I, th I think that's a very interesting comparison, also the geographical moment and <clears throat> these different cultures prevailing. And I was wondering if we see that kind of, you know, fractions in society, the different cultures pre prevailing, um, the fake news problems that we spoke about. We also saw that, of course, liberal mainstream media have been very strong in the last four years counter arguing. But I at least had the impression that they would never reach out, you know, to the Trump voters. Is that something, is there an option that, you know, these voices, you know, these liberal, these uh, modified voices will reach Trump voters at least to get 
into some kind of, you know, political debate because, you know, the reconciliation, the healing talk that Biden spoke about, you know, making compromises, uh, that means that there are, you know, different people sitting at the table and trying to talk to each other. So is there an option to, to reach out and is there an option also to kind of, you know, fight that fake new thing to, to, to get people on board again? Or would you say that's illusionary, you know, liberal media never will make it to uh, speak to them or at least to provocatively speak to them who they really want to address? No, the liberal media will not reach the Trump masses. But politically, I do think we saw in the Bernie Sanders movement an effort to talk about class politics that would appeal uh, to people on the basis of their class interests and away from cultural issues. And uh, you know, the average American does not have $400 saved in the case of an emergency. And that kind of politics would require the Democratic Party to loosen its ties to Wall Street and to Hollywood and to the suburban technical professional class and resume its efforts. We see a little bit of it with Biden to build uh, or try to rebuild trade union movements, to focus on uh, universal health care, on a $15 minimum wage, on material issues, uh, which uh, workers, at least in the former industrial parts of America, uh, Rust Belt America, uh, could find convivial, would find attractive. Uh, so I think they can be reached by a by an aggressive policy of uh, even the Green New Deal, properly packaged, promising both serious attention to environmental issues and a retraining of the former industrial working class so that people, workers don't say, I made $30 an hour working in the factory and my son is making $9 an hour working at Walmart. Who's going to change that? Well, Trump was the only one who really promised to do it. Bernie Sanders began a politics moving in that direction. But that would be a crisis for the Democratic Party. I think that is a very, very tricky problem because that might be uh, also something that, you know, if you talk at, you know, the consequences of globalization of neoliberalism, we, we need to face and <coughs> Uh, to, to maybe my last question, uh, the perspectives on Europe, because what you explained, you know, what happened to American democracy, that's not limited to the United States of America. We, we see at least, you know, some kind of these problems in Europe too. And the problem that people will not have enough money, that the future of the children might not be as prosperous as the future of the parents were, you know, daddy earning 30 bucks in, in, in a factory and the son or the daughter now working for Walmart and earning only nine bucks and, you know, having mini jobs and, and all that kind of things. Maybe not as intensively as in the United States, but we are we are facing the same phenomena in, in, in Europe. And if Europe now was to learn from what happened in the US in the next in the last four years, what what advice would you have, you know, for democracies in Europe to get a bit more robust and to be a bit better prepared? I know that's a very unfair question because that's not only tricky and difficult, and also you know the position of giving advice. But you know, I think your analysis was so striking and so pointed uh, that I think we can we can use it as a blueprint also for many phenomena we face in Europe and I'd be in, in particular interested also in your perspective on European developments because I know very well that you are most familiar with what happens in Europe and that's what also we European wish from our American counterparts that you know we uh, have people who to talk to who know Europe very well, and therefore your insights would be in particular uh, interesting for me. Well, I, I, I'm struck uh, that you, uh, in your question, uh, used Europe as a singular pronoun, a singular. That was a provocation, yeah, absolutely. Because certainly, if you follow some analyses, uh, Wolfgang Streck, for example, uh, the argument would be that German success is based on. Uh, the economic uh, domination of uh, other parts of Europe. This goes back to the question of, of Greece and, and the Euro uh, and uh, whether to consolidate uh, European finances uh, and lending and you know, the whole question of solidarity across Europe. 
I think the good news is that austerity politics seems to be abandoned, um, but it's not clear what replaces it. I mean, one can see with Very Macron, true. you know, Macron, who um, you know starts out as a member of a socialist party and then uh, tries to do a kind of modernization of the economy that requires eliminating uh, an inheritance of French social protection, uh, which makes him, you know, an enemy of the of uh, not just the yellow vests, but of much of the French working population. So I don't know that there's one answer for Europe besides that austerity has to be abandoned. Now, whether a level of solidarity can be achieved uh, that, uh, you know, the German middle class, which likes, um, you know, two slices of Kuchen with cafe at four o'clock in the afternoon is willing to uh, sacrifice to save uh, the Greek, uh, uh, in the indebted Greek shopkeepers. You know, that's, that's a tough question. So there are many difficult intra-European questions. But I would say from the point of view of democratic governance, uh, the situation with Hungary and Poland just cannot be allowed to continue. I, it, it cannot be allowed to continue. And at the European level with the European Christian Democratic parties tolerating uh, the, the um, Orban Kaczynski uh, politics, um, it's, it, it doesn't bode well. The erosion of the judiciary, I'm not one who, thinks that the judiciary is, you know, the gatekeeper of, of freedom, but um, it's a very bad sign. One of, the, one of the positive notes that I would take out of the last few months in the U.S. is that of the 60 Trump lawsuits to try and overturn the election, not even one, including those heard by judges whom Trump himself appointed, not a single judge was willing to... Uh, uh, endorse the Trump project. Um, and so I think um, it is important to protect uh, that branch of government and what's happening in Eastern Europe is not a good sign. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think that would be uh, quite a lot of things and topics to talk about in another talk. But unfortunately, our time tonight is already over. And I'd like to, to ask a, a final question. You know, we, we spoke so much also about the party structure, the party situation in the United States of America. You mentioned uh, gerrymandering and, and, and uh, the bipartisan infrastructure. Would you see any hope that in the future that, you know, bi-party dualism in the U.S. would be overcome and maybe, you know, we would see a United States of America in the future having a multi-party system uh, with, you know, the Greens and maybe, you know, a Trump party and others and it would be much more fragile or would you argue that, you know, your voting system and everything create such a stability that also in 100 years from now, I know it's another glass bowl and crystal bowl question, in 100 years from now, we still see America as a bipartisan country with the Republicans and the Democrats. As you said, you know, since there is no orientation and differentiation, those big parties, they have to uh, comprise and to include so many different groups from the far left to the far right that, you know, the internal coherence consistency of these parties is always challenged and becoming more and more fragile. Well, you're actually right that the battles are fought within the parties. If the United States had a system of proportional representation, this would be a very different country. I mean, Bernie Sanders would be uh, the kingmaker uh, yeah. in, instead of the defeated primary uh, contender and uh, the Republican party would also have split and in the same way that you have in Germany, a, a Green Party, which depending on the issues can be a partner of the Social Democrats or of the Christian Democrats. You know, here we have a Democratic Party that contains both the, um, uh, the remnants of the industrial uh, world as well as the kind of technical professional class, which in Germany is drifting to the Greens. Uh, here is stuck in the Democratic Party. Um, so it would be a very different country if we had proportional representation where coalitions could be built uh, around uh, shared agendas without sacrificing 
the long-term identity of the party. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the, the costs for a new party uh, are extremely prohibitive. Uh, we had Ross Perot, uh, your students probably don't remember that, but uh, Bush the first lost re-election because a self-made uh, billionaire, Ross Perot ran as a kind of uh, independent Republican. And that's how Bill Clinton got elected. You know, it, it, um, you, you can uh, perhaps defeat someone, but you can't win. Uh, that seems to be the lesson of third party movements in the United States. Even going back to Gore and, and Bush II, uh, Ralph Nader, you know, in Germany, 7% would have made him the decisive figure in the Bundestag. Uh, here, it, it made Bush the president. Absolutely. I think that's a very important uh, kind of link uh, between the party system and the voting system. And uh, I think that might be quite difficult to be overcome in the future. So, so I'd, I'd also see the United States be a bipartisan country rather also for another couple of years and, and maybe a couple of decades. It's One word on the gerrymandering okay. since the questioner was interested in that. Yeah. Uh, so the Republican Party has been much more effective than the Democrats in local and state government. And congressional districts are established by state legislatures with only two or three exceptions out of 50. And so the Republicans have enjoyed immense dominance, I think in 37 out of 50 state governments. And they are then able to establish congressional districts that are solidly uh, red. Uh, they give away a few to those that will be solidly blue. Um, but only if the Democratic Party returns its focus to grassroots and state levels is there any chance to do anything about the gerrymandering of congressional districts, which makes it necessary for Democrats to win approximately 53, 54% of the vote in order to obtain a national majority. Thank you so much. A very, very last question and two very brief answers. You know, If you had to give two wishes tonight, one to Donald Trump and one to Joe Biden, what would be your wish for Donald Trump and what would be your wish for Joe Biden? So my wish, I guess, for Donald Trump would be if instead of using the golf cart, he walks when he plays golf, he will become much more fit and much happier and he'll be around there longer and the return to Great. politics, a second act would not be useful. Um, to, to Biden, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, now that you have appointed uh, a very diverse staff and um, hopefully satisfy those who think that how you look is an important determinant in what you think and what you do, uh, that it's time to move on to the politics of interest and class interest in particular, and to drive forward a new deal uh, politics. Thank you very much. I think that was a perfect final remark. We all might expect and hope for a new deal. Thank you very much for that wonderful, most insightful talk. That was a great evening. And I hope that, you know, if you are re-invited for, you know, other insights from the US, you will also agree to have a chat with the Europa colleague. It was a great, great pleasure for us also to our audience. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. There hopefully will be many other talks of the Europa colleague and we will be very happy and warmly welcome you. Thank you for joining. Enjoy a wonderful evening and uh, all the best to the United States of America, all the best to you. And in these times of COVID-19, of course, stay safe and healthy. Have a good night. Thank you very much. I'll also on behalf of my Lanzweiter. Thank you so much. Great. Bye-bye.